Hello and welcome to this last lecture in this lecture series on digital forensics with me, Joachim Sjöverstad, from the University of Skövde. And now we reach the stage of this lecture series where we're going to introduce some a little bit more advanced memory forensics. And we will do this with a demonstration of the open source tool Volatility uh, from Volatility Foundation, which you can download if you search for uh, volatility forensics in Google and it will show up. It's available for Windows, Linux, Mac OS I think. Uh, however I do prefer to use it on Linux because it gives me the opportunity to use the built-in Linux commands for uh, filtering of the results and so on and so forth. And uh, So basically volatility is a command line tool um, which uh, works in the way that you have your memory image and you use volatility and apply different so-called modules uh, in order to do different things. Uh, if you Google volatility, there is a very good user manual um, which lists all of the available modules, everything that you can run. And there is also, if you Google volatility sheet sheet, there is a very nice sheet sheet that you can download. And if you work as a forensic expert, this is something to uh, really put up on your wall so that you know uh, what to do. And, and basically, uh, if we get at it, what you need to know is that depending on the operating system and the operating system version, uh, the mem memory structure will, will differ. So the first thing you need to do, do when you get working with volatility is to figure out um, what memory profile you need to use. So volatility uses different memory profiles depending on uh, what operating system the computer where the memory was captured was using. Uh, so if we go right at it, you can see that I'm in my terminal here on my uh, Vola box or my, my Debian installation with volatility. So what I need to do is that if I look in this uh, folder here, I have a memory image called spy.vmem and this is actually an old memory dump from Windows XP uh, and I'm doing this uh, demonstration with that very old memory dump because it's quite small. I tried to do it with a newer Windows 10 memory dump but uh, since that was a 5 gigabyte large file it took forever to run run a command and forever in, in terms of doing a demo was uh, somewhere about 5 minutes. Uh, but you should know that uh, pretty much all commands, unless I say otherwise, are usable for newer versions of Windows as well. So, uh, as I said, the first thing we need to do is to figure out the basic syntax of volatility, which is basically volatility, and then you specify the file that you're working with, with dash f, so volatility dash f, and in this case spy.vmem, uh, and then you're supposed to type down the profile. We don't know the profile yet, but Volatility has a built-in way of figuring out uh, or analyzing the memory image and figure out the file to use. So uh, we supply image info here, which is the Volatility uh, module that tells us what uh, memory profile we should use. So we're just hanging hanging on here and volatility will tell us that uh, and as you see here uh, the first part of the output is suggested profile and then it's Windows XP Service Pack 2 uh, x86. Uh, it's as someti sometimes as it does here it suggests multiple profiles and usually whichever uh, any one of them will work um, and if not just go ahead. There is also some more information here like the number of processors that were available on the machine, um, the image date and time, which is the time and date when the image was captured expressed in UTC, and there is also the image local date and time, which is the time and date when the image was captured uh, expressed in the in the, with the time zone settings that was applied on that computer. Uh, you should note, however, that this is uh, the time settings that was set on the computer where the memory was captured from, and not necessarily the real time. Uh, so, let's get on to the actual uses, usage of volatility. Uh, again then, you just hit uh, up arrow and you have volatility minus f spy i dot vmem, and now we can 
tell what profile we want to use. So we go dash dash profile equals and then the profile uh, win xp sp sp2 x86. And note that this is uh, case sensitive, so you have to spell the profile exactly as it's spelled up here in the suggested profiles. Uh, so now we basically have what we need to address our memory uh, with the correct profile. So now it's basically about starting to mash down uh, different uh, different modules, and there are there are some modules for just displaying things like the active processes, what files that were open, and so on and so forth. Uh, there is also a module called JaraScan that you can use for uh, free text or regular expression search within the memory, um, and there are some uh, modules that you can use to dump stuff uh, as files, and we're going to have a look at those. Um, first off, I'm going to show you three uh, modules for listing processes, beginning with PSList. Um, which basically outputs all the processes as as if as it, you would expect if you're running uh, some process uh, like something like uh, top uh, in Linux. So looking at the list here from PS list, you see a bunch of uh, processes. You see the if we scroll up a little bit, you see the process name, you see the pair process ID, parent process ID, and when it was started, and when it was exited. And there is an, another way to do this, which is the command ps3, which outputs uh, sort of a condensed list, uh, but it outputs a tree structure, as you can see here, so that you see what processes that belongs to other processes. And this is, of course, a very nice way to figure out what programs that was running at the time of the memory dump. So we're not going to dig deeper into this, but there is one more way to display processes that I want to show you, and that is PS scan. And PS scan is what you want to use if you want to look for processes that are, were was terminated or that are hidden. And the difference between PS list and PS scan is that uh, first you need to know that process the process list in memory is stored like a double linked list. So it begins at one place, listing uh, in memory, listing one process, and in the end of that memory segment there is a pointer to where the next process is stored, and in the end of that memory segment, it's a pointer to where the next process is stored. Uh, however, a common way if you want to if you want to hide a process, a common way to hide the process is to uh, destroy this linked list so that so you you make it so there is no pointer to your uh, process to your evil process. But the thing is that PS list will walk this double linked list from from start to end and list all processes that are are found with this process. Uh, however, PS scan will scan the entire memory for processes. So you can find uh, processes that are hidden in this way using PS scan. Uh, and something that's interesting here is that if you do both PS list and PS scan and you figure out that uh, there is something that is listed with PS scan that wasn't listed with PS list, then that is a sign that there is something hinky with that process. So that's it for processes. Now we're going into uh, find some networking information and this is where it differs a bit between those older versions of Windows with, with the newer so uh, what I want to show you here is first up sockets which will basically output uh, information that is similar to what you would get if you were using uh, netstat so you have the different connections or the different act active sockets here starting with the process ID, uh, the port in question, um, what protocol, TCP or UDP and what address. So this is basically where the active sockets on the system. And then there is another one for networking which is conscan which which scans the memory for for active connections, so if we do that we get the active connections um, and if you're working on a system that is newer than what is it, Windows Vista or something or maybe even Windows XP, then you can do NetScan and NetScan will output both of the uh, 
uh, information similar to both of those commands. And this is of course a second step you would take if you expect that a computer is infected with a Trojan or something and if you're working in a criminal setting this is what you would do to well, maybe there is uh, somewhere, some case where you're interested in network traffic. Maybe someone is communicated with communicating with some someone, and you will see if want to see if there is an active connection to that computer uh, on the other side of the world, um, where drug trade is being discussed or whatever. Uh, so that's it for networking. N now we're going into wind to analyzing Windows Registry a little bit, and something that is quite interesting is looking for the list of registry hives that are loaded into memory we can do that with the hive list module and what's interesting here is that well first of all you get verification that software security and SAM uh, and system the four hives that you would expect are loaded but you can also see what ntuser dot that files that are loaded and by doing that you can get a rough idea about what users that's been logged in because you know that whenever a user log into the system that users uh, ntuser dot that will be loaded into memory so for instance in this case we have ntuser dot that for administrator ntuser dot that for local service ntuser dot that for network service that means that those users have been logged into the system since the last reboot, because otherwise their ntuser dot that files wouldn't be in red uh, in the memory and of course using the hive list there's ways to to dump uh, the memory hives and you can read about that in, in the sheet sheet uh, basically what's interesting with Windows Registry is that there are some keys that are volatile some keys that may be changed during runtime but will not but when the computer is is turned off they will not necessarily be stored in, in the persistent uh, registry hives that are stored on disk so there are some registry keys that will only reside on the memory hives when they are in in memory so for that reason it can be a good idea to extract the registry hives from the memory dump and use those hives for analysis um, next up I want to show you uh, quite a cool function which is hash dump uh, hash dump is basically a module that will dump the uh, NTLM hashes for the users that are present in, on the system. So there's two things that uh, hash dump will give you. It will give you the username and the relative identifier for every user on the system and it will give you the NTLM hash that you can use if you want for instance if you want to for, try to cr crack the password of the user for instance. Um, and yeah, I will I will leave it there. Uh, that was hash dump. Uh, next I want to show you something that's not going to give any results here but there is a command called true crypt summary that will give you a summary uh, of all possible information relating to true Crypt summary: All possible information relating to TrueCrypt that can be found in memory, which can, in some, which can, for instance, tell you whether or not TrueCrypt is active on the system. But if the user of the system decided to uh, cache the encryption keys for uh, TrueCrypt volumes in memory, you can actually get the keys for the TrueCrypt volume uh, just handed to you uh, in this fashion. This is a module that takes a little bit of time to run and it's because it looks for many different things and then tries to summarize it for you. What we get here is nothing which basically means that TrueCrypt was uh, not active on the system at the time of the memory dump. Um, next I want to show you uh, Yara Scan which I told you about and Yara Scan is a search utility where you can do uh, free text or uh, regular expression ser uh, searches. So if I go Yara Scan and then dash um, dash Y, and then I can type in a regular expression after here. So maybe I want to look for clean. 
I, I would do that li like so, and we have to have those around there, and then we will just start a a search for the regular expression, which in this case was clean. So I will get uh, I will get back every instance of I'm stopping this. I will get back every instance of the word word clean, as you see here, clean clean up, and the following date that is located in memory. You can do things to how you uh, you can use different options to Yara scan to make it display more or less information around the uh, search sheet, and you can also uh, make it show you information that was before the search sheet. Uh, I just want to show you a very quick example of how you may want to look for different web pages. So you can go www or http uh, or maybe a uh, yeah like that. And in this way, you can search for web traffic or stuff related to the web. Uh, so Yara, the thing is that when you're using a memory profile, you can read the memory in the correct way. When you're using, for example, FTK to search through memory, you're searching through memory as a big dump of data, which means that you cannot necessarily search for uh, the processes uh, in memory or the data in memory uh, consecutive because you m remember uh, what fragmenting is all about it's about one one chunk of data may be stored a little bit here a little bit there and a little bit there uh, when you're using a proper way of analyzing the memory as we're doing here uh, volatility will understand that those different bits of data are bel belonging to the same data chunk. But if you're looking at uh, the memory as one big heap of data, you're looking at it as an unallocated space and the analysis program will not understand how to build together the chunks of data from when they're fragmented. Uh, so that was it for Yara scan and before we end this demonstration, I want to show you one module that I think is really cool, which is Screenshot. And what Screenshot does is that you have to supply uh, somewhere to, uh, to output the screenshot, but it tries to create a screenshot of uh, uh, each and every active session. So if I'm logged into the computer where when the memory dump is created, then Screenshot would try to model uh, what a screenshot would look like if I took one when I was sitting in front of the computer. Uh, so the com command is basically Screenshot uh, dash D and then we have to specify where to put the uh, where to put the dump and I happen to know that I want to put it in my home folder on, under down load and uh, no under desktop and then uh, in dump and then we wait <laughs> and then I did something wrong let's look at a screen let's look let's look on the sheet sheet Oh, this version of volatility requires me to do dash dash dump there instead. So like that. Dumpter equals. screenshot so now you're getting to see all the hinky stuffs all the mistakes that everyone does so if we go home desktop dump okay maybe it doesn't want the ending Please supply an existing. Okay, so let's just do. Uh, MK make directory dump now. 
now it works. Uh, and you see that there is a bunch of screenshots being generated and basically there is one for each and every active session. So if we go back here and now we have to go into Volatestimg, SpyEye, there is my dump directory. Uh, you see that there is a bunch of, of different screenshots here and that's because there is one for every active session uh, on the system where the memory dump is from. And most of them will be... Uh, empty because there are non-graphical sessions, but I just want to show you here that there is actually a screenshot from which you can get some information. So in the bottom here is the time, there is the usually the open windows and you can see what programs that were open with windows and so on and so forth and it's really nice. So that was actually all for this demonstration of volatility. Uh, I urge you to Get used, get used to the program on your own. Go to Volatility Foundation uh, by searching for Volatility Forensics in Google. Uh, look at the user manual and try it on your own. Download the cheat sheet and get going because this is a very nice and underused way to do uh, memory forensics. And that is actually all for the entire lecture series on digital forensics. I hope that you learned something and uh, have a good time.